welcome everybody to this uh, event and to those on the live stream and in the room. Um, my name's Camilla Fenning. Um, I work for the independent climate change think tank E3G. Um, and I work in the um, fossil fuel transition team, working with civil society and governments on trying to accelerate coal to clean. Um, this event, GRIDS as an energy transition enabler, is absolutely core to that kind of work. Thank you so much to GEOEC for inviting me um, to moderate. And um, thanks very much. Um, we've got um, two excellent panelists here who I'd like to introduce now. Uh, so firstly, we have Ali Kazma, who is from, I'm going to have to read out the, uh, the acronym, RECRI, uh, the Regional Centre for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, based in Cairo. Ali, welcome, Ali Kazma. And then turning to um, Rob McDonald, Managing Director, Transmission for Scottish and Southern Electricity Networks, based in the north of Scotland. So two very diff different sort of weather conditions, but probably some similar sort of grid issues are on both. So welcome very much to the panelists. And we hope to um, join shortly um, Antonella Bat Battalini. So um, we'll, we'll wait for her. But, but firstly, um, just one issue. Um, before joining E3G, I was with the British government and um, worked on climate and energy issues in Southeast Asia, trying to get those sort of countries to scale up their renewable energy and phase down, phase out coal and stop building new coal. And the answer to the grids question, the answer to the renewables question was always, the problem is the grid. And the answer is also that the grid is the solution. So um, it's just really important. As a diplomat, I'm not a technical expert, um, but I know how important grids are. And so I'm really interested in, in your views as to what we can do to sort of try to get the grids in better working order in, in, so that we can implement the renewables onto the system that's so badly needed and how we can get the sort of political impetus as well as the sort of technical impetus to make that happen. So I'd be really interested, um, but first of all, if you would just sort of set the context of your organization and what work you're doing around kind of grids as an energy transition enabler. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, hello, Lydia and gentlemen. I'm happy to be with you today. I'm Ali Khazma from Regional Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. I'm working as a renewable sustainable energy and environment expert in RECRI. RECRI is an intergovernmental organization based here in, in Egypt. We have a, a 17 member state. We are responsible for some technical assistance for this member for the technical ass assignment, policy assignment, economic assessment related to energy, renewable energy and energy efficiency. My expertise is before for uh, wind energy and photovoltaic system and some and have a master in uh, interconnection wind energy to see the, uh, the quality and interconnection between the wind turbine and the grid. And decide to this, I have some expertise as the expert environment to see for the bird migration, impact on the bird migration environment for the wind farm and photovoltaic system. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much. Rob. <laughs> the green light, there's the crew. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Holly. So morning, everybody, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you uh, this morning. Um, to answer your question, Camilla, I really think we are central to the grid transition, to the sort of energy transition uh, in the UK. I look after the transmission system in the north of Scotland. Uh, we are, just some context, um, if you look at the Climate Change Committee and their forecasts for how we decarbonize the, the entire UK, fully 10% of the carbon that needs to come out of the UK economy, and this is not just energy, this is across everything, needs to come from renewables connected to our network just in the north of Scotland. So we account for about 2% of the UK's population, 10% the total decarbonisation just in electricity, just in my system. So I think we have a huge role to play. Very, very important we deliver our 10% and probably more. What that means in generation terms is we're an 8 gigawatt system, i.e. we have 8 gigawatts of generation, many renewables connected to our system today. To be on the net zero pathway, we need to be 
about 15 gigawatts by 25, 26. So I nearly double by the middle of the decade. And by 2030, we need to be a 24 gigawatt system. I treble where we are today and probably more. So that shows you the scale of the challenge. In monetary terms, to get to the 2030, we will have to invest somewhere in the region of 10 billion pounds sterling over the next seven years. So this is a huge, huge challenge. And to answer your question, Camilla, about what can, what can governments do, I think one of the things that has uh, caused us issues hitherto is we've had quite a piecemeal project approval, project by project by project. When we see a wind farm come along, then we, then we do the grid. And that's kind of got us to where we are today, and it's sort of worked up till now. But if you're talking about doubling and trebling the network, you can see that that's not going to work. So what we need is a long-term plan for the grids, setting out at project level exactly what's going to be built out to 2030. I'm pleased to say that the penny, I think, has dropped in the UK amongst the politicians and regulators. And I'm hopeful that this calendar year you will see before Christmas uh, approval of what we call the holistic network design. That's a joint piece of work with the other transmission companies that will do exactly that, that will give us that, that plan. But we'll see because we're not quite there yet. But that would be a huge step forward. And I think that would be a key point I would suggest for other jurisdictions too. Thank you. Do you want to come in there, Ali? Okay. Thank you. I think I think uh, the the big challenges for the integration a huge renewable energy in the grid. It is the you know grid stability and flexibility. In the Arab region, on African, I think we have the wiki grid, not the strong grid like U UK. So we need a lot of study for capacity this current to to able to take this renewable energy. You know, the flexibility, fle grid flexibility, it is to ability this grid to make a frequent imbalance between the supply and demand. And now our grid, it is conventional power system. So it is not really to uh, adapt for huge penetration renewable energy in the grid. So we need a lot of solution for this program. Yes. Thank you very much, thanks. So I'd like to introduce our third panelist, <laughs> Antelena Battaglini, um, from, from CEO of the Renewable Grid Initiative. Welcome. So we were just asking panelists initially just to sort of set out the kind of landscape and their organisations work around the kind of key question, which is, you know, around grids as an energy transition enabler. So if you're able just to sort of spend a few minutes talking through the, the Renewable Grid Initiative and, and what you see as the, the main landscape and challenges and maybe solutions, given that it's Solutions Day here at COP. Thank you. Thank you very much, and apologies for being late. I'm being fooled by my calendar, <laughs> let's put it this way. Uh, so, um, Renewables Grid Initiative is an association of transmission system operator, climate and environmental NGOs from across Europe. We came together, I mean, you just have to consider that these were enemies in the past and in many other countries beyond the ones we are working on, they continue to be kind of enemies because they have opposing interests. Uh, we came together already in 2009 because we realized that uh, it's not possible to have um, a future based on renewable energy sources, mainly wind and solar, without having uh, a very strong and robust electricity grid. I want to stress the fact that uh, we have been alone in this space for over a decade because today everyone is uh, starting to talk about grids, but still this remains a very narrow conversation. Uh, we have spent uh, over a decade pushing for stopping coal, uh, after that uh, pushing for renewables, but we really ne never understood that without a very strong electricity grid, we cannot have any renewable future. And we are going to uh, this more and more, basically in all countries. So um, Renewables Grid Initiative has occupied this space with a very ambitious uh, line of uh, uh, activities because not only we wanted to make sure that uh, we have the grids we need to integrate renewables, but we want to build them without impacting nature and while taking people along. 
public opposition to energy infrastructure, and in particular electricity grids, is very strong. And it is not just uh, um, a European madness or a Western world madness. It is happening everywhere. In the middle of Africa, where you think there is nothing here, you start building something, and immediately you have groups opposing that. And so it is uh, of paramount importance to actually find the solutions, and these solutions are already there to build the grids in ways that not only do not have an impact on nature, but they also bring benefit to both nature and people. Um, so, th generally speaking, I believe that uh, the electricity grid today remains a kind of uh, forgotten child in many of the discussions, so I really welcome this session at the solar and wind pavilion because you cannot keep asking for higher renewable targets that cannot be delivered, by the way, because we do not have the supply chain in the next few five years or so to increase the target without actually focusing on electricity grids. If you fail to deliver the electricity grids, what will happen is that you have a suboptimal solution which is going to be very costly and from a system point of view definitely not what society will need. Um, solutions to do that, um, I think that, uh, um, that we don't need studies, sorry. I think we need to share the knowledge because today we have, wow, this chair. <laughs> um, today we have countries that have learned to manage an electricity system which is for days and days exclusively based on wind and solar. The, we don't need to know today how to manage a system with 100% variable renewables. We only need to know what is the next step and the next step. So it is an incremental process of learning. This knowledge is very limited with few countries and we need to find a way to actually share this knowledge because we don't need to reinvent the wheel every single time. Thank you so much. Um, you've touched on this already, but maybe I can turn to the other two panelists around a rather negative question, which is that if we don't get the grid investment, say, in the next 10 years, what are the impacts on the chances of, of countries meeting the sort of net zero target? You know, how, how serious of an issue is that? And looking out to the sort of 10-year time frame. Rob. We won't hit the target. It's as simple as that. It is as, as stark as that. Um, let me give you some real numbers and some examples. Again, forgive me, I talk about my network in the north of Scotland, but I'm sure this is true in other, in other places. So I have a project, uh, a, a link from uh, Peterhead uh, uh, offshore down into Yorkshire. Uh, every year that's scheduled to come in 2029, 2030, which is, is beginning to go under construction. Every year that's delayed, costs about 300 million pounds sterling in constrained payments. And you can see that customers are paying that. So you can see if, if we were to connect more renewables on the back of that, the cost to consumers just becomes unbearable. So we will have to start saying no to people to connect. It's as stark as that. We need to get the grid right if we're going to deliver the targets. Thank you. Ali. Uh, before the where we need to investment in the power system, I think that some of solution for that it is my knowledge to, to invest in maybe to for that to be stable the grid and flexibility to storage in the uh, battery system to be smart because you know we will convert from the conventional power system to renewable power system. If we talk about to share about 50, 60, 70 percent of the capacity from renewable energy, we need you know uh, there is a lot of technical issue from the power system for the inertia, for the frequency, for the stable, you know, the very energy, it is a variable. So we need to invest in the power electronic as inverter because the inverter, he is responsible to stability the system and to exchange the power between the consumer and the generation. And we need to invest 
I think in the battery system, it is very important to transmission line to make some microgrid for some in the, um, in the area it is uh, out of the, like Africa, we need this. I think we need to uh, transmission line between the region. It is very important to increase the short circuit system. It is because, you know, uh, uh, if we have a not strong grid, it will be a lot of generation to be out of the surface. So we need to, to invest in this area to have more muter uh, grid, grid system for this. So I think the impact if we not invest in this area as technology, as maybe capacity building, exchange mission, um, a lot of impact as environment and economic and social after 10 years. We can this, we need to act now, make something now, action, to start to adapt this grid to be able to take a lot of generation because after 20 years, I think a lot of synchronization generation depend on natural power maybe, on some fuel, it will be phased out. So if we don't have the alternative for variable energy, so you, you, you can imagine a lot of dark will be and a lot of product depend and will be, you know, uh, um, you know, see the differentiating between the economic and our region, and uh, Europe, it will get a lot of problems for the socio-economic, yes. Thank you. Antonella. Yeah, so the, um, I must say the devil is always in the details. We cannot speak generally what is needed. We have to look specifically at the country, at the region, and at the demand profile of the region we are targeting. Um, most of all, we need to think energy with the mindset of the future and not the mindset of the last millennium. Um, of course, we need inertia, but today there are already new ways of producing inertia. We are, there are new ways of thinking the energy system. So one of m my main recommendation is to First of all, not have an electricity approach, but a system approach. Consider that uh, um, we cannot pick winners in the sense that we will need a lot of different solutions happening at the same time. And depending on the region or the location that you are referring to, you will see that uh, you will do more centralized generation or more distributed generation or, or and the real task is to plan the system in the best uh, optimal way. And the best optimal way is always through complementarities. So I go back to my previous point, capacity building in system planning and operational uh, expertise is what is today is really needed around the world. There are very few individuals, I would say you count them, you can count them, that are able to understand system operations from an insider perspective. How do we get this knowledge? It's a big, big question. And um, if you fail to transfer this knowledge, what will happen is that you end up copying a system that is today obsolete, it will not deliver the targets that we have in mind, we wish for, and it will deliver stranded assets and very high costs for consumers. Thank you, Antonella. And talking of stranded assets, I wanted to come from a sort of slightly different angle, from the coal angle. So a lot of the work that my organization uh, is doing is, is doing at yeah. the moment is around... Stop it. <laughs> ...is around... Um, no new coal, trying to encourage countries uh, that, sti that still have a coal pipeline to, um, to, to, to end their coal pipeline. There are only 34, well, there are 34 countries that still have planned coal projects. Um, so, you know, we need to stop Sim. those being built, é um potencial para essa sustentabilidade as pequenas. There is no way that we're going to meet our Já net zero target. So, you know, when we go to those countries and those governments and sort of try to encourage 
them to end their pipelines. Of course, the answer is, the question back is always, well, you know, we, we, we can't get the renewables on online because the grid is not strong enough or whatever. So again, this is just why the stranded asset <laughs> issue can come more forward. If those plants are built now, they will become stranded so assets, yeah, and that's there for, you know, decades and, uh, and completely uh, undermines the chances of, of the world getting to that net zero right. position. Um, I just wanted to pick up something, Antonella, you said around best practice. Oh, and, and I just wondered, you know, in terms of solutions, which countries um, are actually, you know, showing best practice? Who can others learn from? And also, is there some kind of like grid diplomacy, you know, through sort of interconnectors and stuff? Which countries are sort of talking to each other and sharing and actually sort of making the grids fit for purpose regionally as well as, as nationally? Um, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that in terms of sort of regional kind of grid work and kind of sharing best practice. Ali, is that something you could come to? About best practice and countries working together. I think this topic, it is maybe security for some operation. So I, I, we, we need, I, from in Arab region, we don't have, you know, the smart grid or, you know, we have a lot of sources for the renewable energy. But I think German and UK and Denmark have you a lot of penetration renewable energy. So I think now, based on the you know climate change and uh, the uh, crisis of the natural natural power or for na natural gas and fuel, I think now the you know the uh, North country make some you know, initiative for that to support South country. Bon. Uh, to see Forma. how we can, passou as you say, passou passou for the any capacity building, it's uh, to make some, you know, some plans for the future. Because we don't have the time to make mature, smart grid to be able to take a lot of renewable energy in the grid. So we need to action now for that. Thank you, Rob. Have you got some ideas on best practice and sort of sharing between countries and how we can help on that? So, yeah. yeah, is that better? Good. N not, not so much on offering advice or, or, or best practice, but your point around how do we share ideas? I think, to be honest, I think that's something we need to get better at. And actually, that's one of my key takeaways from COP. I've been really struck when I've been on panels like this. I talk to a lot of super smart people in different jurisdictions all around the world. And you know what? They're facing exactly the same problems we are. They're asking exactly the same questions and figuring it all out. And we, we do have bilateral relationships, we're involved in um, various groups like ITAMs and ITOMs at a European level, different things with, with other system operators, but it feels quite piecemeal a little bit and that's one of my takeaways I think about how do we get um, better connected, if you'll pardon the poor pun, uh, as, as transmission companies and sharing some of, the, some of the information, best practice, lessons learned and those sorts of things. I think that's a really good important point. Thank you. Um, Renewables Grid Initiative has been engaging in uh, capacity building on a number of issues, especially uh, we have been teaching c civil society what how the system works and what are the questions that they should be asking. And we hope that uh, we will be able to move into more capacity building. That by the time, by the way, we are doing it in, in Europe because it's not that in Europe we don't need it, we need it as well. So we are deeply involved in TYNDP process, a 10 year net development, 10 year net development plan, which is defining uh, the, uh, the planning of the entire energy infrastructure, electricity infrastructure, but it's of course in, the, in a system perspective at European level. Um, I think that uh, we also need to be very careful on terminology because you have referred uh, to smart grids and very often we use buzzwords. So what is a smart grid? Uh, it doesn't really mean anything from a technical perspective, but the, the real question is how do you optimize your assets and what type of digitalization, what type of uh, um, additional element you add to an existing grid or you plan with this in mind. So 
it really requires a completely different mindset because a system that is based largely on wind and solar, or maybe even exclusively on wind and solar, has to be designed from scratch to be able to actually um, be fit for, for purpose. Digitalization will play a huge <laughs> role in this. Entre de um, and what we see today on the ground Normalmente, in many, many countries is that the grid is still a kind of a forgotten child. I've already mentioned this, coisa muito simply because this is serving the interest of the uh, fossil fuel. If you don't build the grid, you have the uh, coal option, which is to build the coal power. So, in a certain way, every time you say no to something, you get to say yes to something else. Estou numa rota tecnológica, bati aqui, aqui não deu certo, vou tentar para cá. Twenty years of stopping coal, but we didn't have twenty years of building grids. Mais ágil, muito mais fácil. And this is what the big change we have got to do now. I think Quando we should not go to government and say, don't do this, but rather go to government and say, please do this, 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 é, and that. Empresa, because this will be the most economic way to do it. Thank you, Mark. No 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 certainly the way that we're thinking, no I think, in the sort of civil society a and sort of think tank sabe, mode, a that we can't just say no new coal. It has to be, how do we get from coal to clean, not via gas? Um, and that's, you know, that, that's, grids are a big part of that. Exactly. I just wanted to pick yeah. up, um, Antonella, something that you said and, and ask you maybe first and then, then come to the other panel members. You mentioned around smart grids and digitalization. What Don't are the exciting things that are coming up in terms of technology? Is there something new that is going to, you know, really have an impact on helping us strengthen and, and build out grid infrastructure over the coming years? You know, are there things, you know, on Solutions Day that we can think of that are down the line and are going to make a difference? I think you asked the wrong question, <laughs> sorry. Because it's never new technology, but it's the complementarity of technologies. And how do you deploy them? So, um, of course, the digitalization is a huge world, and data, data flows are very important uh, for uh, the grid of the future. M maybe I answer in a different way. Um, to your question, because, yeah, that doesn't fit with my way of thinking, but the, mm, with increasingly um, higher share of renewable energy sources, we need to also increase visibility and operability for the grid operators at all voltage level. Because if you have a lot of input and you want a stable grid, then the grid operator has to be um, able to see what is happening and to operate what is happening. Um, and, and this requires a lot of coordination among the different actors. And it also requires um, a regulatory framework that would allow the grid operator to indeed operate. Um, so what we have seen uh, happening more and more is thanks to digitalization, we can have uh, a higher utilization of assets. This is important, but please don't be fooled by the idea that digitalization and smartness would remove the need for building grid infrastructure. That's not true. Uh, we are moving into uh, an architecture that is completely different and therefore, we need to a, a grid infrastructure that connect these different sources, generation sources. And finally, um, we are always thinking about generation, but most of the gains will come from the demand side. So we really need to look at the entire system, including the demand side, because the demand side in the very near future will be the highest source of flexibility. Thanks, Antonella. And coming to Rob, either in terms of new technology or in terms of better complementarity. You know, back to you. I, I agree with Antonella. I think that, look, there isn't a magic silver technology bullet that's going to magic this problem away. Uh, for sure, there's, we're seeing an awful lot of new technologies being deployed, HVDC uh, at scale and, uh, that we've not seen before. Uh, new technologies to replace SF6 on the system, better use of data and digitizing, better use of 
um, data in substations to avoid maintenance and those sorts of things. But to my mind, this is about making sure that we're doing the investments efficiently, making sure we're building just the right amount of grid and squeezing absolutely every um, megawatt of generation that we can get from the existing grid. But none of that will obviate from the need to build massive infrastructure. I'll come back to the numbers I started with. We have to double and treble the system in a little over seven years. There's not a, if there was a whiz bang widget we could go buy from a shop that would stop us doing that, great, but it's, that's not, that's not gonna solve that problem, fundamentally. Ali. I think for the, you know, uh, low level distribution, I think we need for the future the smart EV charger because it is very important during, you know, the, like, photovoltaic is, is, you know, not stable, or is we can some, we, we can charge and discharge this power. So it's very important. I think some container, smart container, based on the batteries and inverter to, you know, you know, the wind energy for maybe 500 megawatt, it is, it is, change every second as power. So we need some, you know, smart container based on the batteries to make this distribution or this generation to be more stable. When we have the, you know, drop off this curve, so this system will be make this charge power to be for the transmission line this stable. And we need to, to maybe th for photovoltaic, we can, to connection in the low voltage and high voltage. So I think the HD uh, high voltage, uh, their current will be the solution for the, you know, evacuate this power for the long distance. Yes. Thanks, Roy. Did you want to come in? Yeah, I think that, uh, again, we need to be very careful on uh, what type of market we have. If you have um, a rural area that is scarcely populated, well, I wonder whether it is really reasonable to do high, vo mm, high voltage grids for evacuating maybe uh, distributed resources uh, at local level. Um, we have uh, in the developing world areas that are very empty and so either you use them to, uh, for bulk generation, very large quantities, and then, of course, you need uh, um, high-voltage uh, grids to evacuate. But I think uh, we also need to understand that uh, we need uh, to give access to electricity to a lot of communities that currently don't have it, or they have it through diesel generators that uh, is uh, not only very polluting, but it is very expensive and it will continue to be increasingly expensive. So um, because of this, I think that we need to work on standards because uh, it's a bit, I don't know uh, who of you has played with Lego uh, and <laughs> Playmobil. You know that if you have Lego, you cannot put it together with Playmobil. Or you need a system that you can connect at a certain point in time, if you want to, but if you use different uh, um, stones, Legos, and Playmobil, you will not be able to connect this. So standardization of certain components, it's increasingly relevant, inclu including uh, um, for offshore. So what we are looking at is uh, um, really multi-vendor solutions that can be hybrid and can be um, connected with different approaches. Can, thank you, and can I just ask on that standardization Lego point, who is, who is working on that? And you know, are governments sort of coming together around that and recognizing that as an important um, solution? Well, government cannot work on standardization. It has to be done by companies. Governments can create a regulatory framework that pushes for standardization. Uh, in the European Union, we had a very strong push to have one plug for charging all mobile phones. It has been a fight. Um, so a lot of this innovation comes from the industry itself. In the past, there was uh, 
um, a very strong uh, feeling that uh, standardization reduces competitiveness or niche, but today there is the realization that actually through standardization we can be faster, we can be cheaper, and uh, of course we can deploy technologies at scale across the globe. Thanks so much. Rob, did you want to come in on standardization yeah, yeah, as well? If, if, I, if I can, just if I can come back to the point I mentioned earlier, that certainly our experience, and I think this is pretty typical of a lot of markets, has been up until now we've had approval of almost project by project for each, each grid. And you can't standardize if it, everyone's different and it's project by project. I think if we get the plan I talked about, and I think good points by Antonella and Ali about needing to engage communities and the plan being different in different uh, regions and needing to be on a whole system basis. But however we've derived it, once we've got a long-term plan, that enables us to standardize. And a very real example, we built uh, a billion pound sterling uh, HVDC uh, upgrade um, about four years ago. It, it was a one-off. Um, we're about to, if we can get these regulatory approvals I mentioned, get approval for four HVDC that are the same. And that gives us huge opportunities to save customers an absolute fortune in standardizing them and also opportunities to deliver them quicker, which means we'll be able to get more renewables on. I think there's a huge opportunity for us, for customers, for renewables and for the market if we can standardize because we've got that long-term certainty that we've not had. Thank you. Did you want to come in on standards, Ali, or we can move on? Yes, comment for something. I think for the target for a, a fall inter a 100 percentage for for renewable energy we can maybe to think out of box maybe to have percentage 50 as a stand alone system. okay the renewable energy based on the location for this renewable like wind on solar and bumping okay and the other to be to be for for the grid to be easy connection i think to be not full percentage for energy on the grid, maybe to be some stand-alone system for every region in the country. Thank you. I just wanted uh, do you want to continue? Um, I want to go back to the concept of energy system modeling. It is important because when you um, model your system, a, a model is not a picture of the future but it is an information tool on the different options that you have. Through energy system modeling, you will have a much robust understanding of where it makes sense to have distributed generation, how do you use distributed generation to become a service to your grid infrastructure, and where instead you need uh, HVDC and whatever else. Going back to standardization, maybe not everyone knows, but today, Cables are produced on demand. They are not on the shelf. Every g project has its own specification. This is not only uh, producing delays and higher cost, but if you have a, a failure and you need repairs, either you keep spare parts or the, this piece of unique cable has to be produced specifically for you. So standardization in cable manufacturing, also uh, some kind of standards of what type of voltage level we want to use. It's a very important discussion and we are, asked, we are really starting to do this now, we haven't done it because the industry didn't want to do it, but now I think we are getting there. Thank you. I just wanted to, to broaden out the discussion a little bit onto supply chains and whether there's, um, m what is the sort of key investment that needs to be done in order to sort of increase grid stability? Rob, can I start with you on that? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, where to start, really? Uh, I, I, I think right across the supply chain, I think it's clear that the supply chain just doesn't exist to do what we want to do. I keep talking about my numbers, doubling and trebling, but it's not just me, and it's not just the people in the UK, companies in the UK, it's all across Europe, it's all across the world, it's renewable companies and uh, network companies all chasing the same resource, all chasing the same um, cable factories and different things. So I think there needs to be investment right across the entirety of the supply chain. That's for specialist manufacturing of equipment, it's about skills. It's about building up uh, capability within the companies, like my own company. Um, we need to think about um, how we stop taking people from each other and 
broaden the, the, the pool of skills. And to my mind, the key to um, unlocking this, apologies if I sound a little bit like a stuck record, is, is to have this long-term plan. Because if we've got the plan, then we can have those richer conversations with the supply chain four and five and six years out to say, how do we train people to be able to deliver what we've got to do? How do we maybe put deposits down and enable factories to be built in a way that we've not been able to do hitherto? So I think we recognize it's a massive challenge. I think if we've got that plan, though, we'll be able to figure it out. Thank you. Ali, do you have some comments on supply chains? Yes, I think uh, maybe we need to make some model to be intelligent, predictive, the weather conditions, because you know the urban energy depends on the wind speed, the solar, the radiation. So I think this is to, to predict the consumer, his need. It is very important to, to make some predict neutral. I think we, we need to maybe investment in the power electronic for maybe inverter, for smart batteries, because it is very important to make the power system stable as frequency and the voltage. And I think we need to make some investment to increase maybe the, the efficiency for the uh, solar because the solar you can it is more stable from wind energy and can to be integration in the all the levels in the power system so we need to increase the efficiency to reduce the number of materials so it is very important key. thank you just if there are any questions from the audience we're drawing to a close in five minutes or so if there are any questions do raise your hand now but i'm going to turn to um, antonella on the supply chain question um, so definitely planning and getting into a uh, conversation with suppliers is important, but I believe that uh, we are moving into a completely different uh, way of handling this, which is through procurement. Because, Rob, you know that you are going to build, and your plan may not be 100% a picture of reality, but it gives you direction. And so you can actually start procuring for the next five to ten years, giving uh, the suppliers the certainty to expand their capacity. And please remember that when we talk about uh, electricity grid supply chain, it's a very broad uh, um, area. Um, just mentioned that uh, one of the biggest bottlenecks today for offshore grid, subsea cable, it's not really the cable as such, it's the ships that bring the cable aside. So uh, understanding the complexity is fundamental, and I believe procurement could really be a game changer right now. Thank you. We're, we're coming towards the end. I wanted to ask the panel, I think we've had a really good discussion, but maybe just to point out one policy intervention or action that they think is really important to enable a you know, more stable and effective grid over the coming years. It may be just reiterating something that you've already said, but I think it's important to leave this panel with just one clear message from each of the panel as to what is the key thing. Um, Ali, can I start with you? Yes, I think we need to, from the high, you know, uh, police, police, police are, um, responsible president, to make the power system to be uh, intelligent or, or to be uh, neutral for renewable energy on the top of the agenda. Because if we don't have a uh, decree from the UK president or anything, we cannot to take this target. Please. Thank you. Rob? Yeah, my one word would be certainty. If the politicians and the regulators can approve the plan, the next seven, eight, nine, ten years, we'll figure out the rest, whether that's planning, whether that's dealing with the supply chain, whether that's uh, managing uh, how we get consent, whether that's stakeholder engagement. We can start to unlock and do all those things, but if and only if we've got a clear vision and a plan of what we're trying to achieve. So that would be my ask of the politicians. Okay, and how do we make that ask to politicians, just to sort of drill down on that a little bit? So, um, well, I think, I think it's about making sure that uh, when politicians and regulators are approving plans for wind farms and uh, offshore wind that the grid is considered as part of that and as part of that long-term plan. You know, most jurisdictions have targets for offshore wind, have targets for, for various different aspects of renewables. Grids needs to be part of that story, I think, if we're going to have um, an integrated system. Thank you. Antonella. Um, 
in Europe, we have all the rules we, we really need, but they are not properly implemented. If I could express a wish, I would like to have uh, a much better mandate for energy regulators, because today energy regulators are still looking for the cheapest solution, but the cheapest solution tends to be always the most costly for citizens and for consumers. So the energy regulators should have a clear mandate to expand the uh, main drivers, not the cheapest, but the most sustainable, where sustainability is not exclusively carbon reduction, but uh, it contains all the sustainability goals that we are committed to, because that would be the only way to have a just transition. Uh, if you build in the most sustainable way, taking environment and people at the same time, at the same level as uh, system security. Great, so thank you so much. We've had a really good discussion, um, covered a lot of ground. Uh, I think I feel optimistic, but it sounds like there's a lot of, lot of work to do. So thank you very much to my panelists and to GWEC for, for hosting this event. Thank you.